Welcome, this is a recorded session of the Post-Quantum Cryptography Conference of the PKI Consortium. This conference would not have been possible without our sponsors in Trust, HID Global, and PQ Shield, and the organizational support of the Post-Quantum Cryptography Working Group of the PKI Consortium, in particular in Trust, Logius, TNO, and CWI. Our next speaker is uh, Andrea Garcia Rodriguez. Um, she leads uh, digital political policy analyst for the EU Digital Agenda at the European Policy Center EPC, published extensively about issues related to the intersection between quantum technologies, cybersecurity, and Europe's strategy for strategic autonomy. Before joining the EPC, she was a lead researcher of uh, a center in Barcelona for International Affairs, where she did research on digital topics and emerging technologies, and was a project manager there. She held several advisory positions at bodies such as the European Cybersecurity Forum, NATO, as Spain's foreign ministry as part of the reflection group for the Spanish presidency. And in 2021, became one of the 13 Spanish women leaders to follow in technology. Andrea holds a degree from the University of Glasgow, Dublin University, Charles University in Prague in Security, Intelligence, and Security Studies with a specialization in security and technology, and further um, degrees from uh, Complutense, where she completed uh, two stays abroad at Charles University in Prague and the Mission of the Thank you, Matt. I really think I should shorten that bio because it looks it looks too big for, for actually what, what, I, what I do and what I've been doing. Um, yeah, that's actually really nice uh, to have this. So, Okay. Uh, oh, they were nice bats. Um, okay. Okay. Now, uh -huh. this is mine. I'm, I'm so sorry, I'm going to change the colors here. Um, well, as I have mentioned before, I worked at the European Policy Center. We're one of the biggest uh, think tanks in Brussels. Uh, hence why you haven't seen me this morning, because speaking about Brussels and trains is always an interesting story. Um, <laughs> So uh, we've been uh, working on quantum technologies for um, almost two years since uh, I joined. Uh, we're actually working with Quantum Delta NL, so coming to the Netherlands it always uh, feels like coming back home. Um, we're working across like, different topics, and because I was uh, working on cyber before as this like super busy bio set, um, I took uh, care of the quantum cybersecurity because I think, we think it's a crucial topic, and still from the EU perspective we haven't worked on that uh, that much. So what I'm going to try to do precisely today is to drive you through a little bit of the, of, um, well, um, the work that we have been doing, the, the um, findings that we have found, and a little bit about the, the next step. So uh, in that sense, it's also an open call for you to come engage and to help us uh, develop this, uh, this, uh, this topic. So um, I am so sure I don't have to explain any of this. But uh, I have to say that I'm, um, I'm normally use this presentation also to go to non-specialist forums. So I think this is a, a nice illustration that when we speak about, like, uh, about quantum computing and cyber, the main message I like to convey is that obviously it impacts the cyber threat landscape. So when uh, we're speaking to like cybersecurity professionals or cyber policy professionals, this is something that we really want to make evident because normally this is perceived as something more from research and innovation, not so much from the cybersecurity perspective, and if you speak to them at the MISA, um, it, they, there is a group where if you go to, for example, again, national cybersecurity agencies, like, yeah, we're monitoring the landscape, we'll see when we have to take action. And this is a little bit frustrating because it's actually already impacting it. Um, of course, harvest attacks, download now, decrypt later, they're the ones that are like easier because it's, it's just like really pops a really nice mental um, image. But how about a um, new type of malware that can come up. How about the combination of quantum and AI? How is that going to impact a cybersecurity landscape? Those are, are things that, that obviously should be a little bit more looked upon. And if we look at the numbers, for instance, if cybercrime, which is a major uh, topic, was estimated to, to be worth 5.5 uh, trillion euros, which is the GDP of Germany and Spain combined, and I, thought, and I think there's still some millions left to add up, um, imagine that if we're not prepared enough, that's going to that's going to boom. Um, another figure, um, 2026, which is tomorrow, uh, one in seven chance of, of breaking is uh, most commonly used. This is public encryption systems, but it is too big for the circle 
to avoid talking about. Um, but how about older things? Because it's not only about like, technical stuff, it's how, how technical topics impact society. So, of course, national security has been widely spoken today, so I think I'm not going to focus on that. But something that from the European Union um, we're like, very like, concerned about, certainly like European economy and competitiveness, my role is within European economy, within the European uh, political economy program, so that's something that we're like, really looking at. How about your company? And then you haven't, like, besides migration, you use the word, like, like transition, yeah, uh, on time. Well, we can have, like, huge problems. How about data breaches, IP theft, so on and so forth. It definitely has an impact. But democratic well-being, I think it's normally like, not so, um, like, reflected upon, but how about trust in public institutions if we haven't been able to migrate in time? So these are only a few examples, but all in all, all, in all the main message is that this is not a tomorrow's topic, this is a today's topic, or even a yesterday's topic. So because I'm based in Brussels, we are trying to work a lot on the next the policy recommendations for the next EU Commission. Um, the next EU Commission, the Commission's terms are like five years, so obviously we're speaking about 24 to 29. If one of the figures that I mentioned before is 26, what the second message for today is that the next European Commission, the next five years, we will see the first wave of disruption unless we have done something about it. Um, and this is uh, just an excerpt from, from the paper. I will do a little bit of self-propaganda later, I promise. Uh, we took like few algorithms, with like the short version of it, and tried to, to see, okay, like examples of today's use. Some of them that, like, that uh, policymakers could like easily, you know, like have a mental image of where. And actually, if you look at the list, it's pretty much everywhere. And uh, the post-quantum security level, we took it from uh, the memos from the White House, for instance, that was one of the documents we took uh, as well, because we wanted, um, obviously, this uh, chart to be, to be useful, uh, especially for policymakers who are not um, so familiar with terminology. But if, so if it's already like an uh, impact in the cyber threat landscape, if the next European Commission is definitely going to uh, deal with disruption, uh, what are we right now? Well, nowhere or if little things are being done, but certainly not where we should be. Uh, we definitely don't have on this, uh, this process, for instance, and we definitely can afford this, which is not that, of course, but that kind of uh, shows where the mindset is, or why do we really need to work on this? Is this a member, is this a member state competence? Should the EU do something about it? it? It has been proven that when the EU regulates or does policy when it comes to cyber security, things work pretty well. So, um, because of that, um, we think that EU coordination is key. Because at the end of the day, what the EU does is precisely try to come together, to put member states together, uh, try to um, help in drafting new priorities, create roadmaps, and, and we have like tools and instruments to like, really push it. But if we look at this like another kind of little chart, and uh, we just like cherry pick some stuff going on, we, we see that there is like a lot of things that definitely uh, we could be doing. So, from the EU member states, some of them have uh, migration plans, that's amazing, but some of them do not have them. And if that is the case, can the EU do something? We believe that certainly that is the case. Um, when it comes to, like, for example, support for quantum safe technologies, uh, EQC is not so much thought about. It's true that most of the efforts when you go to funding, when you go to awareness, when you go to the quantum flagship, um, when it comes to quantum safe technologies, they all go for, for QPD, or most of them go for QPD related activities and research, which is amazing. Yet, it, I, in our perspective, it should be balanced, and there should be like more work. Uh, when it comes to QQC, we cannot think, okay, we're going to have an amazing quantum internet, it's going to be like top notch in like a few years, and then w once we have it, we're going to be able to secure what happens in between. We cannot like really do this anymore. Um, so, um, this is like a little bit of, of what I wanted uh, what I wanted to show you. Um, again, um, all this all these things will be available. So if you have like any question later, I'm trying to uh, really um, get to the questions because I, I think they're very interesting uh, considering this room. But yeah, we need a little bit more. So this is the self propaganda part. Uh, we wrote I wrote a paper. Um, a few months ago, mid-July, so um, I'm so sorry. If you haven't seen it, it's completely okay. Uh, it was summer, and I hope you were like on vacation, not like me. 
Um, <laughs> and, uh, and all these like tables and, and infographics and things like this, they come from this paper. It's a really short one because we wanted to, we wanted the paper to be collectible. There is another one coming in a few months that's going to be a little bit more comprehensive. But what it argued, um, based on, on what I said before, is that um, we are we have a digital single market, and that's the main asset of the EU. The single market is so great, and and we are trying to advance in the integration of so many things. Right, like we're trying to integrate our economies better, our political systems better. But uh, we are as um, strong as the weakest link in the chain, and there is a great asymmetry in the European Union. So a cyber attack on any part of it, at the end of the day, can have spillover effects on the rest of the economy, and that's why we need to do something. Um, also. Why do we need EU coordination? Well, for instance, prevent cybersecurity loopholes. Uh, that's, uh, I think, a, a very big thing. And ensure that all member states are equally resilient to cyber attacks. Um, I normally, like, I travel a lot. Um, and when I go and speak with smaller member states, they all tell me the same thing. We are five people, six people in the team. Um, we have to deal with upcoming regulation, like monitor the threat landscape, uh, think of like how to react and all these things. I cannot think about uh, like one thing. I don't have the time to talk to the people. Uh, this is not something that I can do. So we have chain commitments. Um, they're super nice, but it's really hard because they're always catching up. And I think that precisely because this is in place, the EU can do something. And so this is this slide. Do not think about it. Um, there was a problem with uh, with, with my PowerPoint, but at least I read the the thing on top, which is a coordinated uh, coordinated action plan on the quantum transition. So that's basically the main. Um, the main recommendation that we have in this paper. Uh, we don't want more regulation. The EU regulates a lot. We know it. Uh, this is not a debate to think of whether or not this is good or bad. But what we think is that if we have a coordinated action plan, this could really, really work well. Why? Reason number one is not mandatory. So you can just like join if you think you want to join. Otherwise, peer pressure will drag you in. It happens with AI. And, and all of a sudden, all member states, they all have AI strategies, and we can argue whether or not we're like top notch in this anymore. But at least there has been like first steps taken, which is something that otherwise it, it couldn't it couldn't happen. Uh, second, if you have a coordinated action plan, it will evolve eventually into a roadmap, and that's I think something that we really really need. So it will help us um, like create or, or or really like see which the priorities are, um, help really like smaller member states to say, okay, I really want to do this, uh, set uh, timelines, uh, which I feel is obviously really, really important, like create like, some kind of like uh, forum to monitor the development of this uh, quantum uh, migration plans, and also like um, it really like try to just like share these like, new best practices between like different member states. And then of course, like having this like uh, bird view from the, from the EU Commission saying, okay, so we're doing excellent at this, we are not so good at this, Maybe we need to rethink how to reach the next stage. Maybe it's about funding, which is like something that has happened before. So a coordinated action plan, uh, that's what we're talking about. But the next thing that we're like trying to... <laughs> I, it doesn't work, but this is nice, so you can just like scan this. Um, <laughs> so we're also like thinking of, of other policy recommendations in this init initial scooping of the landscape and like really trying to uh, translate what is happening to policy or policy language. Um, a coordinated action plan is the main thing that, that we need. But how about other things? We don't really need to bring them here. Uh, the paper is called a quantum cybersecurity agenda, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we need like new people, new bodies, uh, new departments uh, to hire all of none. Of them. We just need to upgrade, take what it what we have, and, and use it as a foundation for the next thing. So how about an ESA thing? We do have a lot of working groups in ESA. How about creating one precisely on any transition, on the quantum transition? We could have like to come the national experts, and then like, we would have a forum. Each of them will like change good practices. Okay, this, this worked. This didn't work. This took me more time than I thought. It has happened before. On the cybersecurity strategy, there was a working group. Why not another one uh, for this? Um, and then we think that, that there is like another thing that could be done, which is like having a dual. Um, like coordination from the EU side, a technical one, for example, to close Rupert's gap, like Rupert nice. So we're providing a lot of funding for quantum. Um, how about, uh, because all of a sudden we see that there is like this massive thing that we really need to develop, how about we dedicate some of these funds that have already like been kind of dedicated to quantum technologies 
uh, to this specific thing that we see is the biggest need and how that's that would be the first the first one the second one is political coordination which again relates to the, to the coordinated action plan but also like to have this bilateral uh, conversation happening between the commission and the different member states should they want to to go and in, in, in have like that that conversation instead of like using all the fora and then the the last uh, recommendation that we wanted to have is for example, like using sandboxes, the, the U.S. has been both um, put forward this uh, proposal. I have no idea if it if it's already lost. Um, I I run in some days after this about like uh, quantum sand like sandboxes for for near term observations, like near term quantum observations. Um, I'm thinking of technical sandboxes, not the regulatory sandboxes, which would be like a different thing, of course. But how about the use? I mean, there's like so many promising research in in, in the EU, but to some extent, it never like really reaches market level and it could be like really fundamental for us in the future as we advance towards towards like this hybrid uh future that we have with us so all in all what i wanted to say is it's precisely that um this is not like in but it's completely fine um i had my contact details in uh, really at the end but i'll be here until the end of the day but what i wanted to but yeah this this was a, a little bit of of the main messages and i know that we have like a really nice audience and it's really like mixed backgrounds and you are already working in policy so if you have any feedback, please uh, please tell us. As for the next step, which was the other thing that I said I would be saying today, is that we um, published this paper in mid July, and it, it, it was like, really well read. Um, it was the New York Times cited that. I, I've been like, flying around ever since. Um, um, some member states have like approached us saying, "Hey, this is actually a really good idea." So we are right now putting together a phase two of the uh, of this program. The idea for us is like we want to really like grow bigger in our consultation with stakeholders so you're like more than invited to come and of course what we want to do is like precisely take those insights and learnings that you may have and translate them into a bigger um, uh, report that, that probably will come out hopefully um, before summer next year for sure um, so so we can just like push these messages and just like try to, to put them into something more consistent uh, we're also working at the EPC level of course with the European Commission um, in different like, in different things, so um, there might be like more things uh, coming about quantum, hopefully. So um, yeah, um, I'm open for, for questions. I think I it was like 15 minutes, so it should, it should be enough. I hope. Um, so yeah, uh, thank you very much for listening and coming to me. So this not so technical talk, but it's an easy to read away. Thank you, thank you, Andrea. We have some questions from the audience, and then uh, we have some questions uh, from the online community. Questions? Oh, we want to um, open and up to um, uh, because um, I mean the EU is working a lot on that, and what we want, I mean, one of the main challenges that we have while writing this is precisely the people who come to us and be like, "Hey, but you're saying PPC is the best thing. How about the rest?" But we have all this money. It's like, no, 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 no. Um, you guys are free to choose what you want. We're only saying there's like some things that perhaps should come with a little bit more of our attention. So the next paper wants to build on this when it comes to PPC. Just like add the other the other half of this and the focus to come hand in hand with it. So for our consultations with member states, it, it feels that uh, so that's what's happening. Oh, I would like to see a miss too, but it's quite tough for content really. Uh, but that's like a personal opinion, of course. Um, I think that many, many years, this conversation that we're having when we just like put together in the same room like national security agencies and we put like together like member states, commission, um, some of them like at the end of the day when you speak to them, it really feels like the conversations we used to have previous to the NIST directive. Like, okay, maybe we need a little bit more. And what this uh, piece of regulation did uh, very well was like identify which are the central sectors for European economy security. And therefore, they should have priority and like new 
um, and, and more obligations than the rest of things, precisely because it plays such a vital role. So that's something that I would like to see in the future, but I think the conversation is not there yet. Basically, because not all member states think, of, think about the same process, and then that's really hard to get into the same issues as one Yes, uh, maybe uh, we now go to one question, uh, or two questions uh, from the online community, and then uh, return to the audience uh, a bit for the first time. Um, okay, so I've got uh, here two questions. With the European quantum startup ecosystem growing, can the newly evolving regulations on P2C have impact on investments in this area and the new business growth? How can the new regulations influence the future of quantum startup in Europe? Well, that's an amazing question because there's no regulation in common, so therefore there's no impact when it comes to that. Um, <laughs> um, I think that um, that's something that like, the Commission of Return has said that there is like a quantum pact coming, and I would like to tell you to just like, keep an eye on that because I know it's coming really, really soon. And that's probably going to give a little bit more of a of shape of the efforts that have been done at the European level. But so far, there is nothing when it comes to regulation, no hard law, nothing. And that's like one of the things that we really want to make sure in this report, that we do not recommend another law that is going to make it, things a little bit more complicated. Ooh, so we're running out of time. I was just <laughs> getting started uh, with this. OK, so uh, I'm afraid uh, other questions will have to be asked uh, during the breaks or at other moments. And uh, mm -hmm. thanks again, Andrea. No, thank to you. Yeah. In today's complex, fast-paced world, you need a partner who can help secure your digital transformation so you can drive your business forward confidently. Someone who can fine-tune and integrate the secure technologies that enable mobile identities, digital payments, and a hybrid workforce. You need a partner who will have your back so you can stay focused on the road ahead and accelerate your organization's growth. Entrust, securing a world in motion.